As inmate W85436, I experienced some of the fear and seclusion of being a prisoner inside solitary confinement. But as a reporter, I wanted to know more. I wanted to hear from the guards and the prisoners themselves about what it really means to be here day in and day out for years at a time. To do that, our crew was given unique access to people and places seldom seen on television. But before we could re-enter the Central California Women's Facility, we had to be searched. Take your you want my bag purse uh -huh. and my watch? Yes. And my shoes? And your shoes. Even the heels of our shoes were checked for contraband. And after a pass through the metal detector and a high-resolution scanner, every piece of equipment was checked and rechecked. Only then were we allowed behind closed doors. Everywhere I went, I had to be accompanied by a prison official. My first escort, Warden Daryl Adams. What do you think is the biggest misconception about life behind the closed doors of a prison like this? Probably all the brutality that goes on, um, the, uh, the constant lockdowns. I think it's important that uh, people know that we're not the, the cruel animals that uh, a lot of the movies and things would have you think. We're professionals. What worries you when you come to work in the morning? I guess any warden's nightmare is that uh, a staff member is um, injured or killed. Has that ever happened here? No. Uh, we, uh, we've had minor injuries. Thank God we've never had a death here. But they should never let their guard down. That's right. It's a prison. The hub of all security operations for the entire prison is located in this tightly restricted building called Central Control. Behind this double set of locked doors is the command center of the prison. Every move of every inmate is monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. From their vantage point at the center of the prison, security officers visually monitor the yard. There are also electronic alarm boards that can instantly alert them to potential security breaches inside the cell blocks and along the perimeter fence. Seven times a day, central control locks down the prison and does a head count. Attention all radio units and watch commander, count time, count time. Every inmate must be accounted for. Central Control is also in constant communication with the prison's two guard towers, as well as the armed guards who drive the perimeter road 24 hours a day. Attention on the arms and the housing units. Oh. Are there attempts to escape here, and has anyone ever escaped? No one has successfully escaped. Come here, fire. Every three months, all correctional officers, male and female, are recertified in short-range handguns and in long-range semi-automatic weapons. But these weapons, kept under lock and key, are rarely used. Do the officers wear guns? The only ones that wear guns is our towers. The theory being that an armed guard can too quickly become a disarmed guard. So their only weapons are handcuffs, batons, and pepper spray. Anytime you let your guard down, they could do just about anything to you to try to harm you. Just how ingenious some of these women can be was graphically demonstrated to me by Sergeant Susan Conley. These inmates are here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as you know, and this is what some of the items that they create. Uh, they all get toothbrushes. They also get um, razor blades, like big shavers, to shave their legs, and they melt it with the uh, razor blade on the end and then use the handle, and that would be considered like a slashing device they'd use. A contraband thumbtack melted on the end of a ballpoint pen becomes a stabbing weapon. Bits of scrap metal stolen from vocational classes are sharpened into knives. A padlock and some electrical cord can deliver a near-fatal blunt force trauma. They can make poisonous type darts. They can put a paper clip in urine and feces and put it in a blow dart, blow it out at you, and hope to get you in one of your vital areas. They have nothing but time in there to think, to think of ways to make things, to think of things to do. And it's not that you're, they're attacking you personally. It, it's any person who's going to go to that door. They don't care who it is. 
The need for constant vigilance, the danger, the fact that even the most innocuous item could be turned into a weapon, these were the feelings the correctional officers wanted me to remember. That these are dangerous women, in fact some of the most dangerous women in the country. And most of them aren't locked up the way I was in ADSAG. This is a typical cell here at the prison, 17 by 19 feet. It's the size of an average bedroom, but it is home to eight women whose crimes can range from check fraud to murder. These cellmates share two sinks, one shower, and one toilet. Privacy is not an option. The first time I had to go to the bathroom with eight women watching me, it took me quite a few days before I was comfortable enough. They stand right here and watch you. Hey, what are you doing in there? You know, well, there is no privacy. Guards look through the window. Everywhere you are, you're looked at. You are never, ever alone, ever. Jean Pacheco looks like she could be the friendly grandmother next door. She's term? been in prison since 1990. What is your term here? In the prison, life without. Life without? Yeah. I'll never leave. I'll die here. What, what got you here? Murder. Aggravated murder. Jean was 44 years old when she committed a drug-related murder with a 22 caliber handgun in Northern California. She is now 56, with a terminally ill husband, a son, and two daughters on the outside. When my daughter had her baby, I wasn't there. I should have been there. My God, my girls had their babies without me, you know. That hurts, and there's nothing you can do. And there's no way I can ever make it up to them. And my girls are good to me, but I know I've hurt them. I've hurt them bad. Do you, do you think your sentence was fair? Yeah. Do you have remorse and would you, do you wish you could somehow make it up to the families of the people involved that yeah. were hurt because of you? Yeah, because when you look back and you look at the intense life that you got into, you know that you've hurt a lot of people. And I can never undo that. And, uh... And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm going to spend the rest of my life in here and die in here. And I will die in here. Jean tries to give something back by heading a prison advisory council. In weekly rap sessions behind closed doors, Jean leads a peer counseling group where older lifers try to prevent younger inmates from repeating their mistakes. It could take a split second to get you a life sentence in here and you never get out. You never get out. Once you get in the system, you don't get out. Yeah, well, not right. It's, it's a revolving door. It's hard because floor. we don't know how to break it. That's all we know is and how to go out there that. and survive. I'm not a violent person. Um, I'm a very good-hearted person, you know. And um, you know, I, I it's just that all I know how to do is sell dope. You know what I mean? Here's the reality of it all. I'm sitting here doing 25 to life after 21 years of coming in and out of the institution. If they gave me a date right now, I would walk out of here and go straight to the connection and probably be back with 25 to life again. So the reality of it is, it's, there's nothing out there for me. There's nothing in here for me either, but there's nothing out there. And I'd be right back because this is what you know. This is all I know. Yeah, I didn't have no parents. You know, I, I had to bring myself up on the streets. I had to start selling dope when I was about nine years old to take care of myself. Here at the Central California Women's Facility, lifer Jean Pacheco leads a group session where inmates like Wolfie, Pops, and Christina express the frustration and despair of life behind the closed doors of the world's largest women's maximum security prison. How long is your sentence? 25 nights. And how old are you? I was 16 when I got arrested, and um, I just turned 19, April 5th. When you was arrested, was you pregnant? Yeah, I was a month pregnant. Where did you have your baby? I had my baby in uh, General Hospital while I was in the county jail, and I gave birth to her on April 16th, 98, and um, I get to spend 24 hours with her, and then I had to, you know, give her up. Christina Francis was convicted of first-degree murder in 1997. 
Her partner in crime is also serving 25 years to life in the same facility. It is her grandmother, Sandra Lopez. They were found guilty of fatally shooting Sandra's live-in boyfriend. When I walked into this gate, I killed myself because uh, I knew that I could not do what I wanted to do anymore. And my baby couldn't do nothing either. And there's nothing I could do to, um, to calm her, her pain anymore. I've been here for two years. And I've been locked up for three years. And how is it? Horrible. You have more than 300 lifers here. I mean, how do you approach them differently? How do they approach it differently when there's no chance of getting out? For the first four or five years, uh, they're very angry, uh, require a, a lot of attention. Uh, they'll, they'll act out, they'll frequently get themselves in a lot of trouble. And then at some point, uh, five years out or so, they, they begin to understand that this is going to be where they live from now on, forever. Everybody says that, you know, if you've been here for a long time, you get adjusted to your time. I'll never get adjusted to this time. Everywhere we went, anger, despair, and hostility were just below the surface. Although we witnessed no signs of violence between inmates, women we spoke to said it is a regular part of life behind bars. You're subject to get your ass beat in here any time. You get into it with someone, and there's not a lot you can do about it. You have to live by a different little set of rules in here. You can't go tell. So you walk around with a black eye, and you try to say, oh, yeah, well, I bumped into my locker. That's you can't go do. tell. You're in prison. Being in prison also means unwritten rules about sex. For the young girls that have never experienced sex and marriage and a family, they turn to homosexual activity. You can see people with hickeys on their necks and know that they didn't get a visit from an outside family member. You know something must go on. But uh, I will tell you that the state doesn't permit sexual conduct between inmates. Uh, so it's not permitted, but do they do it? Obviously, somehow they probably do. But by far the biggest problem behind closed doors is drugs. More than half of the women in this institution are here for drug-related crimes, and 85% used drugs on the outside. Despite all the security, I was shocked to learn that many of them maintain their addiction on the inside. We probably have 500 women in this institution that will never change. They cause the majority of the problems on every yard, their whole life is, is searching for drugs and figuring out ways to bring it in, getting their families busted, trying to get it to them. Most drugs come through the mail, so every bit of incoming mail, more than 1,500 cards and letters every day, is opened and searched for contraband. We're filling for any lumpy areas in the letter. Maybe there might be some drugs hidden underneath a sticker or a stamp can have Polaroids here. Because there's a backing, they could maybe hide drugs inside them. Through the mail, the drug of choice is black tar heroin. A postage stamp size quantity can keep an inmate high for 12 hours. To combat the problems associated with drugs, sex, and violence, free time is kept to a minimum. And every inmate in the general population must follow a closely monitored routine. It's called doing the program. Every prisoner must either go to school or work. Nowhere did we see women making license plates. Instead, there are a variety of programs that attempt to teach real-world skills. In the Joint Ventures program, low-risk inmates make circuit boards for a private company operating inside the prison. They earn up to $8 an hour and gain marketable skills. Carlitha Stewart is serving 25 to life for conspiracy to commit robbery. With time off for good behavior, she'll soon be eligible for parole. I've been locked up for 20 years, and what this program has really given to me is it's keeping me abreast of the modern things that has changed within that time. This is, this is a blessing to me, because I can go back out there not thinking that this is 1979 and things have changed. They've given me the skills and opportunity to be able to go back out there in 2000 to be able to get a job. Here, you feel like you're making contributions to society. You feel like that you're a part of society. It helps you maintain some goals, get some type of direction. 
And at least this one program seems to be working based on the prison return rate or recidivism of the inmates here. The recidivism rate in that program has been between 20 and 25 percent as opposed to 70, 80 percent in the general population. And part of the success of that program is due to the fact that these inmates are at what is considered a real job. The prison is also combating recidivism by helping inmates who are scheduled for release stay clean and sober. Our cameras were allowed behind closed doors where I sat in on a therapy session with the prison's most successful program called New Beginnings. All the years that I put into gang banging, selling drugs, abusing people mentally and physically, that's the energy that I'm putting back into this program. This is a wake up call for me. I'm a, this is my first term. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grasp at everything I can get in this program because I don't want to come back. I don't want to lose my children to the system. I don't want to lose my home. But while the women here spoke positively about their ability to stay clean on the inside, they all shared the fear that they would not be able to cope with life on the outside. When I go home, am I going to be able to function? Am I going to be able to go to the grocery store and be able to make out a list and be like, you know, I need to, whatever. Am I going to be able to pay my bills? Am I going to be able to do this? Because you haven't had that responsibility. Everything is like, do this, do this, and do that. They tell you what to do. Will I be lost without, without that? I have been an addict for 24 years. So when I go out, I'm wondering, like, what, what am I going to be able to do? What's going to be feasible? What, what, what's, what can I offer, you know? Because I feel like I have nothing to give. In that aspect, I am really lost. And I'm really scared. I'm really scared. They have an opportunity to reclaim their lives. And not just for them, but their, their children, their families. And I guess here you're teaching many of them to even open up and accept that support for probably the first time ever in their lives. Yes, they have to take risks. They have to open up and talk about things that have happened to them in their childhood or in their past that they've never probably told anybody. I've been a, a runaway. I've been a hooker. I've been everything. I can't do it anymore. I can't. I can't live a, a life of lies. And I'm going to do it. And, then, and I want anybody that can come here to do this, to learn to live one day at a time. It's hard. People don't have to live out there in the streets using drugs, and they don't have to sell their bodies, and they don't have to, to do, put up with abuse, and they don't have to do this anymore. You know something? I, I really, truly believe, as painful as it sounds, I mean, just listening to you, mm -hmm. do you know how much it seems to me, and you'll probably say this, is that is that you're helping everybody else here yes. by just releasing all of that? I needed to release this. I've been holding this in for months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Sorry, good. Right now. No, 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 don't be. But I'm very grateful. Mm -hmm. The overall theme is giving them back their dignity, letting them know that they're still valuable, that they're salvageable, because the majority of the women incarcerated here in this program are going to be leaving within uh, 6 to 24 months. So they're going to become our neighbors, our waitresses, they're going to be driving on the same highways that we're driving on. And we all will benefit if they're able to do that soberly.